Hello, and welcome back to my channel. If you are a subscriber to my channel, welcome back, and thank you for your interest and support. If you aren't a subscriber but would like to see more, please like, subscribe, and click on the notification bell so you don't miss any of my new interesting videos. All right, so the name of this video is Black Women of European Nobility. This video is part two of a two-part series, the first part being Black First Ladies of the United States. So to better understand this video, I highly suggest that you watch part one first. The purpose of this video and other videos that I've posted is to reveal the people of color that have been whitewashed and hidden behind the veil of white supremacist revisionist history. There are two words that I define in this video. Those words are complexion and brunette. Understanding what both words mean is very important. You can find a link to the first video below in the information section. I have received several comments on previous videos stating that complexion does not mean skin color and brunette only refers to hair color. I also indicated in part one of this video series the term brunette was changed in modern times to only mean hair color. This change began to occur due to the miseducation received in schools by proponents of the eugenics movement and the surge of white supremacy at the turn of the 20th century. These terms were unofficially redefined and instituted within the rewritten history that was literally created and solidified by the Woodrow Wilson presidential administration between 1913 and 1921. I want to show you that most often authors, writers, and editors will describe someone they are writing about with three categories, complexion, hair color, and eye color. These are three descriptive words that are not ambiguous. Therefore, a writer slash editor would be redundant if complexion and hair color both meant the same thing. Why would they bother using all three terms if only two were sufficient to describe a person? I'll tell you why there is this confusion. It's because commenters believe and assume that all Europeans had white skin. That's why they disregard complexion as being a separate category. I'm going to try and emphasize this point as we go along in this video. Okay, so without further delay, let's get on to the good stuff. All right, so just an FYI, all these articles come from newspaperarchive.com. So this first article is from the London Magnet, dated April 5th, 1869, page six, column two. The title of this article is A Dane's Opinion of English Ladies. Okay, so first of all, you might be wondering, what is a Dane? Well, according to wikipedia.com, the Danes were a North Germanic tribe inhabiting Southern Scandinavia, including the area now comprising Denmark proper and the Scandian provinces of modern day Southern Sweden during the Nordic Iron Age and the Viking Age. They founded what became the Kingdom of Denmark. Okay, so now that we understand that he is from Denmark, the article goes on to state, Everyone expects in the description of an English lady to find her represented as agreeable, elegant, and graceful, or, to sum it all up, in one English word, ladylike. The ladies of other countries may perhaps possess intrinsically and extrinsically many other excellences such as greater beauty, more dedicated wit, and higher musical talents, more through learning, quicker apprehension, softer womanliness, etc. But an English lady bears away the prize in this particular. She is the most ladylike. English women are not remarkable for great personal beauty. Among the thousands of faces to be daily met with in the streets, it is natural that some pretty faces will be found, but there are also very many which are absolutely ugly. The most general type of face among English women is a fine oval with small, delicate features, lively eyes, brunette complexion, black eyebrows, and dark hair reminding one of the Norman blood which flows in their veins. But there are so many differences of form, feature, and complexion that it would seem as if there were a mixture of all possible nations in their style. The sound of the thick sole and high heel is as regular as if one beat time for it, and the steps are so short but rapid that one is obliged to take care not to be left far behind should one wish to accompany the fair pedestrian on a shopping or walking expedition. They ride extremely well, looking as if part of the horse and knowing how to adapt themselves to its every motion and are also well-skilled in graceful management of their flowing riding habits. and dancing, they are extremely graceful. So, according to the author, English women are the most ladylike. Then he mentions, the most general type of face among English women are described as a fine oval, small delicate features, lively eyes, brunette complexion, black eyebrows, and dark hair reminding one of the Norman blood which flows in their veins. Okay, so as a side note, the author feels the physical attributes of English women are aligned with the Norman attributes. So what is Norman blood? 
Well, according to Google, Norman, member of those Vikings or Norsemen who settled in northern France or the Frankish kingdom, together with their descendants, the Normans founded the Duchy of Normandy and sent out expeditions of conquest and colonialization to southern Italy and Sicily and to England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland. Okay, so back to the article, which further goes on to state that there are so many differences of form, feature, and complexion that it would seem as if there were a mixture of all possible nations in their style. When the author mentions differences in complexion, in my mind, that means that the English women range from light to dark. As we see in women of color today, they come in all shades. So just to remind you, this was published in London in 1869, four years after the end of the American Civil War. Let me also remind you that the author, when referring to English women, stated that his description of them was of the general type, or as I would say, the typical type of English woman. I'm not sure if any of you have seen the play Hamilton or the TV show Bridgerton. Those shows are not far off the mark. Actually, they are being extremely conservative as to how many people of color were present at that time. As I have come to find out, people of color have run the gamut from the pinnacle of royalty to the most abject, impoverished person. Okay, so let's move on to the next article from the Philadelphia Times, dated March 11th, 1888, page 3, column 1. So the title of this article is French Women, the Leaders of Society under the Republic, Madame Carnot's Salon, Grace and Charm of the First Lady of the Land, Wives of Leading Members of the Government. Okay, so I'm going to start reading where it says, A few years younger in years, though not in aspect, than Madame Carnot, Madame Floquet, has a brightness and activity that distinguishes her from her colleague in the Flauberg Saint Honoré, the two being otherwise in many respects not entirely without resemblance. Madame Floquet is much of the same coloring as the president's wife. Both are essentially brunettes, with the same raven's wig hair and lustrous dark eyes, the same soft southern brown complexion. But there is a radiance in the eyes and around the lips of Madame Floquet that give her a varying charm of expression, particularly her own. Madame Carnot's special attribute is serene dignity, Madame Floquet's irresistible winning grace. Okay, so I'm going to stop reading right there because I've read, obviously, what I wanted you to hear. So if we look at what I just read, right away we know that Madame Floquet and Madame Carnot, who was the French president's wife, are much of the same coloring. Both are essentially brunettes with the same raven's wig hair, lustrous dark eyes, and same soft southern brown complexions. At this point, does anyone think the author is only talking about their hair color? I really hope not. So let me make this clear. The president of France's wife in 1888 was a woman of color. And both women in the article are considered very beautiful, charming, and dignified. Okay, so the French people were generally people of color. There's plenty of documentation that will back that up. I'm also going to create a video on the French at some point. On another side note, it is my belief that the French and their nobility conquered Haiti and never left. The Haitian generals we are familiar with were not Haitian natives. They didn't suddenly learn fluent French, dress in French-style uniforms, and miraculously learn how to repel advanced European nations. It appears to me they were French-born soldiers and nobility who taught the indigenous population how to fight and speak French. Again, let me make this clear. This is my theory. I haven't proven it yet, but I hope to soon. All right, so moving on to the next article, which is from the South Haven Messenger, dated October 25th, 1895, page 7, third column. So the title of this article is Duke and Heiress, Marriage of a Vanderbilt to a Churchill. So I'll start off reading where it says, Mrs. Consuelo Vanderbilt is the daughter of William K. Vanderbilt and the granddaughter of the late William H. Vanderbilt. She is about 18 years old, very tall, very vivacious, and quite good looking, with dark hair and a pronounced brunette complexion. She is the heiress of one of the greatest fortunes in the world and has only one care in life, that her father and mother are divorced. Of course, it can scarcely be expected that so young a girl should have as yet very pronounced characteristics, but her friends say she has much sweetness of disposition and charm of manner, and her executive ability has already been tested. As is always the case with children of parents with great fortunes, she has been most carefully educated and trained to understand the responsibilities of her station and to act as a mistress of a great establishment. All right, so in this article, right away, I recognize the name Vanderbilt as one of the wealthiest families in the United States during the 1800s into the 20th century. 
So back to the article. It states that Consuelo Vanderbilt was 18 years old, very tall and very vivacious, and quite good looking, with dark hair and a pronounced brunette complexion. Do you see where the author mentions hair color first and then states that Consuelo has a pronounced brunette complexion, meaning two separate features? Does anyone doubt that a pronounced brunette complexion is not referring to her skin color? Okay, so I have another bit of evidence regarding the Vanderbilts. Here is another article from the Wisconsin State Journal dated November 8, 1889, column 5. All right, so this article goes on to read, George Vanderbilt, who is about to build the splendid country seat at Asheville, North Carolina, is the youngest son of the late William H. Vanderbilt. He is a bachelor and is now about 27 years old, is tall and slight in figure and of a dark complexion, hair and eyes. He cares nothing of society and is most happy when in his library with his books. His legacy from his father was about seven million, together with a library and many of the pictures in the Vanderbilt Gallery. Okay, so George Vanderbilt was the uncle of Consuelo Vanderbilt, and he too, as you can see in the article, has a dark complexion, hair, and eyes. Again, here you can see that the author describes George with three separate categories, dark complexion, aka skin color, dark hair, and dark eyes. Something else that is apparent to me is that both uncle and niece have dark complexions. Therefore, their parents, or one of their parents, had dark complexions and their parents before them had dark complexions, of course. And as I'm making abundantly clear, the photos we are presented with don't tell the same story. Please keep that in the back of your minds. Also, if you haven't seen my video called Vanishing Black History, check it out. It will provide you with some of the insight as to what I believe happened to the photographic and written records. All right, so moving on to the next article, and this one is from the London Mainly About People newspaper, dated September 17th, 1904, page 12, column 2. The title of this article is The Countess of Harrowby. Ultimately, I'm sure someone's going to comment and say that I screwed up the pronunciation of that last name, but that's what I'm going by, Harrowby, and if that's wrong, I apologize. All right, so this article starts off, Lord and Lady Harrowby have returned to Stanton Hall, their place in Staffordshire. Lady Harrowby was Miss Mabel Smith, daughter of the late William H. Smith and of his wife, Lady Hambledon, who is still alive. Before her marriage, she bore the title of Honorable as the daughter of a peeress in her own right. She is an attractive woman, young, handsome, with a bright face and that brilliance of coloring seldom seen except in the Irish or Spanish people. She has a deep, dark blue eyes, brown hair, and a brunette complexion. In fact, her appearance reminds one of Lady Cynthia Graham, and of the dead Duchess of Lannister. Lady Harrowby has two children, a 16-year-old daughter, Lady Frances Ryder, and the young heir, Lord Sandon, who is now nearly 12. She is a devoted mother and spends the greater part of her life in the country. Okay, so we can see that Lady Harrowby was described as attractive, young, handsome, with a bright face, and a brilliance of coloring seldom seen except in the Irish or Spanish people. Now, who thinks the author, when using the phrase brilliance of coloring, is referencing her hair color? He is obviously describing her skin color. The author also breaks her description down into three separate categories, dark blue eyes, brown hair, and a brunette complexion, aka brown complexion. When the author mentions brilliance of coloring, I believe they are saying she has a very rich brown, blemish-free skin. The author goes on further to say that this coloring can also be seen in the Irish and Spanish people. Now, I haven't mentioned the country of Spain very often in my videos, but I plan to soon. However, I have spoken extensively about the Irish and how many of them were very dark skinned, AKA black Irish. All right, so this next article I wanna show you comes from the London Mainly About People newspaper and it's dated October 11th, 1902, page 10, column one. Okay, so the title of this article is Sir John and Lady Milbank, and it goes on to state, Sir John and Lady Milbank have arrived in London. Lady Milbank was Miss Layla Creighton, daughter of Colonel Charles Creighton and niece of Lord Earn. Her beauty has been remarkable from childhood, and she affords an excellent type of the well-known Irish loveliness. Her hair is very dark, her eyes large and expressive, and she has a brilliantly tinted brunette complexion. At the time of her marriage, she shared the fate of many a soldier's wives, for her husband was forced to leave his home and beautiful bride. 
Right, so we can see that the author states that Lady Milbank affords an excellent type of the well-known Irish loveliness. Remember, I just mentioned dark-skinned Irish, a.k.a. black Irish, in the last article. Now this author basically says the same thing about this lady. The author also breaks down her description in three parts, stating that her hair is very dark, her eyes are large and expressive, and she has a brilliantly tinted brunette complexion. Again, the author is not talking about her hair. Her brilliantly tinted brunette complexion is her skin. All right, so moving on to the next article, which comes from the London Mainly About People newspaper, dated August 22nd, 1902, page 22, column 2. And this article is titled Lady Tweeddale. All right, and this article goes on to read, The marriage of Lord and Lady Tweeddale is a case in point. The Marquisate of Tweeddale counts as one of the oldest and most important in the peerage, ancient in lineage, and sufficiently well endowed with lands and money. In the spring of 1878, the present Lord Tweeddale, when still Lord William Hay, met the young and lovely Signorina Candida Bartolucci, and at once fell desperately in love with her. She was a daughter of Signor Vincenzo Bartolucci of Cantano, near Rome, a man well known in the musical society of both London and the continent. Lady Tweeddale is still a very handsome woman, and in those days must have had a rare and radiant beauty. Tall, dark, with masses of dusky hair, a brilliant brunette complexion, and a queenly carriage and bearing, this young Italian girl looked like the traditional empress of a storybook romance. All right, so I'll leave it there. Let's look at how the author describes her. He calls her tall, dark, with masses of dusky hair, a brilliant brunette complexion. He further says she has a queenly carriage and bearing. This young Italian girl looked like the traditional empress of a storybook romance. Let me bring your attention to the fact that, and I've said this before, that women of color and their beauty were celebrated prior to the early 20th century. So let's take a look at this next article from the Philadelphia Times, dated July 28th, 1889, page 1, column 2. This article is titled, A Royal Wedding, the Earl of Fife Married to Princess Louise of Wales, then under the subtitle of Route of the Procession. All right, so this article goes on to read, Among the first arrivals were Lord and Lady Randolph Churchill, and in this floral bower, with her clear brunette complexion admirably set off by a dress of yellow satin and a large diamond star shimmering above her forehead. Lady Churchill made a most striking feature. Maria, Marchioness of Aylesbury, in royal purple velvet, arrived just after, and then came Lord and Lady Wantage, the former wearing a general's uniform with many medals. They had seats on the left, below the organ, and Lord and Lady Salisbury also took seats on the left. Mr. Gladstone wore the uniform of an elder brother of Trinity House, a dark blue with epaulets. Okay, so we can all see that Lady Randolph Churchill was described as having a clear brunette complexion, admirably set off by a dress of yellow satin. Now, her complexion is clear because it is free of blemishes. Many of the English people at that time had facial skin that was pockmarked by smallpox, and the nobility often used copious amounts of makeup to hide it. England suffered numerous outbreaks of smallpox dating back to the year 1610. The author also states that her dress was set off, or as I interpreted it, contrasted favorably with her brunette, aka brown, complexion. Okay, so I have one more article referencing Lady Randolph Churchill that I want to show you. And this article is from the Philadelphia Inquirer, dated January 15, 1899, page 32, uh, column 2. Okay, so this article starts off, Lady Essex, who made her mark in London when Miss Adele Grant is a very pretty woman with good complexion and dark hair and eyes. While Lady Randolph Churchill has always been a very striking figure in society on account of her raven black hair, dark eyes, and rich brunette complexion. Lady Arthur Butler is another beautiful American, and Miss Dudley Lee is also admired, not only on account of her good looks, but also smart dressing. The reason I wanted to show you this particular article was that the author states that Miss Adele Grant is a very pretty woman with a good complexion, dark hair, and eyes. So if, as many naysayers often protest, complexion refers only to hair color and potentially eye color. However, Miss Grant has dark hair and eyes, but the author states that she has a good complexion. While, on the other hand, Lady Randolph Churchill, in quotes, has always been a very striking figure in society on account of her raven black hair, dark eyes, 
and rich brunette complexion. Do you see where I'm going? Both women have dark hair and eyes. Why then does the author say Miss Grant has a good complexion and not a brunette complexion? Is it because only Lady Randolph Churchill has brown skin? Not only does she have a brunette complexion, but a rich brunette complexion. You know, unfortunately, some folks will never see the truth, no matter how many factual videos I produce. Okay, so here's an article that you might find really interesting. It comes from the Windsor Review newspaper dated July 7th, 1882, page 4, column 4. Now, I know this video was supposed to be all about the ladies. However, I had to include this king because it was so relevant to the topic and he was featured in the same article. All right, so the title of this article is A New King and Queen. This article begins, King Milan Obrenovich IV is half a Romanian in blood, his mother having been Mademoiselle Katergi, a member of one of the oldest and best known families of Romania. On his father's side, he comes from the peasant Miloš Obrenovich I, his grandfather, who succeeded Kara George, or Black George, the first liberator of Serbia from the immediate domination of the Turks. Prince Milan was proclaimed Prince of Serbia on the 2nd of July, 1868, after the principality had been governed several years by a regency appointed by the National Assembly after the terrible assassination of his relative and predecessor, Prince Michael Obrenovich III, the most enlightened ruler Serbia has ever had who laid the foundations of the best institutions now enjoyed by the inhabitants. The King of Serbia is about 5 feet 11 inches in height, very strongly built. He has black hair and eyes and a swarthy complexion. His face is broad, and when his features are at rest, he is rather a handsome man. So, quick takeaway here is, we are talking about Eastern Europe. What I am slowly revealing to you through my videos, and I hope you are realizing, is that all of Europe was ruled by people of color. Let that wash over you for a minute. Okay, so the author of this article notes that King Milan Obrenovich IV is 5 feet 11 inches in height, very strongly built, he has black hair and eyes, and I emphasize, and a swarthy complexion. Again, there are three separate categories for his description. Okay, so let's move on further down the article to the Queen of Serbia. Okay, so this article starts off, the Queen of Serbia is perhaps the most beautiful member of the reigning families of Europe. She is above the middle height, with an elegantly molded form, black eyes and hair, a brunette complexion, almost faultless features, and a manner that wins its way at once to the hearts of all whom Her Majesty endeavors to please. Dressed in a long trailing robe of black velvet, the Queen of Serbia would grace the proudest court and Christendom. Two children have been born. The eldest born, August 14, 1876, was named Alexander after the Emperor Alexander II of Russia, who was the godfather of the young prince. The younger, born two years later, only survived a few days after seeing the light of day. All right, so as we can see, the queen is noted as being above middle height with an elegant molded form, black eyes and hair, and a brunette complexion. Again, three categories regarding her description. I'm sorry if it seems like I'm beating a dead horse, but as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, I will be continuing to hammer home this point about complexion. All right, so moving on again, we're looking at an article from the London Mainly About People newspaper, dated May 30th, 1903, page 21, column 2. All right, so this article is titled Lady Mildred Cook, and the article goes on to say, Lady Mildred Cook has left London. She was Lady Mildred Denison and a sister to the present Lord Lundesborough. Her marriage with Sir William Cook, a wealthy Yorkshire baronet, took place last summer. Lady Mildred is tall and slender, with dark hair and a brunette complexion. Like most North Country women, she is a keen lover of sport, and although she does not hunt, she rides, drives, and walks with guns. For a baronet's wife, Lady Mildred Cook has an unusual number of fine jewels including three tiaras and three complete peruas of rubies, emeralds, and diamonds. All right, well, first of all, I've got to say, Lady Cook is no joke. This woman rides, drives, and walks with guns, and she's loaded with rubies, emeralds, and diamonds. All right, so the author states that Lady Cook is tall, slender, with dark hair, and a brunette complexion. Although the author left out the eye color category, he does use the conjunction and, which in context means in addition to, so basically, he states, dark hair and a brunette complexion. Okay, so this next article is from the Marysville Tribune, dated August 12, 1885, page 4, column 3. 
The title of this article is Russian Women of New York, and it goes on to read, The female Slav is an interesting study. Physically, she is slight, of medium height, with ruddy brunette or shallow face, eyes that are kind in expression, but with murky depths beyond the surface of which no one can penetrate. These women are quiet to almost stolidity, but alert to catch everything that passes. They are not talkers, even among themselves. Pass it around to the credit of the nation. They are good wives and mothers, perfectly temperate, well-disposed, but showing that they consider a woman is made by the Creator to simply exist for man's good. An inherent sense of being possessed, owned as a chattel, is openly the Slavic woman's reigning idea. As a rule, they are not neat in person, not uncleanly, but untidy and unkept. Their natures are slow, cold, indifferent, as if hope were undesirable, energy a waste of material, ambition a stranger. This, of course, is all among these squalid ranks. The Russian lady is quite another individual. There are but a few in New York City. They are tall, symmetrical, with social tastes and refined manners befitting the highest station, a type of womanhood of the Christine Nielsen order, only more of the brunette complexion. So interwoven with the Hebrew element is this limited Russian citizenship, it hardly forms a distinctive one. Such as it is, it possesses interest for its exclusiveness, forbearance, with privation and its intelligence. Our Slavic poor give the courts, societies, and police no trouble at all compared with some of our foreign brotherhood. Okay, so after reading this article, the author obviously does not have a high opinion of women. Quite the Adam Henry, if you catch my drift. Anyway, Slavic people were generally from the areas of what we now consider Eastern Europe and throughout Russia. You can see here on the map. The author describes Slavic women as slight, of medium height, with ruddy brunette or shallow faces, eyes that are kind in expression but with murky depths. In a second paragraph, he makes a clear distinction amongst Slavic women, stating that above he was describing the squalid ranks, or basically the poor. However, the Russian lady is quite another individual. He also says there's only a few of these women in New York, and they are tall, symmetrical, with social tastes and refined manners befitting the highest station. He compares them to Christine Nielsen, a famous musician and vocalist of that era. Then he says of the Russian ladies, they are only more of a brunette complexion. Basically, he's saying they are a browner complexion. He further goes on to say that they are so interwoven with the Hebrew element is this limited Russian citizenship, it hardly forms a distinctive one. I will leave this Hebrew mixture he's addressing for another video. Okay, so this is the last article I'll be sharing with you. It's from the North Adams Transcript newspaper, dated June 29th, 1899, page 2, column 2. Oh, and by the way, this paper originated in western Massachusetts. All right, so the section of the newspaper where this article is coming from is called the Royal Box. And basically, it's the section of the newspaper that is dedicated to royal persons generally from Europe. The first paragraph deals with King Umberto of Italy. Also, I know this video was mostly dedicated to brown-skinned European women. However, I had to slip this one in because it was so relevant to my entire premise that Europe was saturated with people of color. So this paragraph states, The Prince of Wales is 5 feet 6 inches high and weighs 180 pounds. He has light gray eyes, a gray beard, a brown complexion, and a bald head. His hands and feet are small. So for those of you that don't know, the Prince of Wales at this time was Albert Edward who later became King Edward VII. So what stands out immediately after reading this paragraph is that the Prince of Wales had gray eyes, a gray beard, a brown complexion, and a bald head. Now, what do all my skeptics say? They say that complexion only means hair color and possibly eye color. So, for instance, if someone is a brunette using their logic, that person would only have to possess dark hair. Well, as I've repeatedly stated, complexion has nothing to do with dark hair or dark eyes. Looking at the article, Albert Edward was not only bald-headed, he had gray eyes and a gray beard, yet he is still listed as having a brown complexion. I don't know about you, but I think that was a great example. Not to mention that we are talking about Albert Edward, one of the kings of England. Anyway, I had many more sources which revealed European women with brunette, aka brown skin, but as I mentioned, I'm trying to keep these videos down to around the 30-40 minute range. 
There is one other issue that I wanted to mention. I've received several comments from viewers that believe that the photographs or paintings I'm showing you are people that are black, but passing for white. That is not the case at all. What I'm sharing with you is that these photographs, etchings, and paintings are not the people I'm describing to you, and that's the whole point of many of my videos. The legitimate photographs, etc., have been deliberately switched with people that are actually white. The task of switching of photos may seem like a Herculean undertaking, but if you watch my video, Vanishing Black History, you will hopefully see how this deception probably occurred. As we can see in the news just recently, National Archives representatives had to go down to Mar-a-Lago, Florida, Donald Trump's residence, to retrieve 15 boxes of classified documents taken from the White House. My point here is that if this can occur in our times, you can imagine what occurred in the past when there was no real oversight, no social media, no centralized national archives, and no internet, etc. What I'm essentially saying is that it would be much, much easier to get away with tampering with documents and photos back in the early to mid 20th century than it would be today. Well, I want to thank you for watching. A big thank you to my subscribers and to all you new subscribers. I have a lot more videos coming your way. The next video will be a very shocking and enlightening one, so please stay tuned. All I will say about it is, a lot of what you and I thought we knew about the Southern Confederacy is wrong. Hey, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of my new videos.